Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the April 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And in it, we're going to conclude our reading of Black Shirts and Reds, Rational Fascism and the Overthrow of Communism by Michael Parenti from 1997. This reading will have chapters 8 and 9. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. And we don't run ads on this channel, so please consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can find a link to Patreon in the video description. So let's move on to chapter 8, the end of Marxism, question mark. Some people say Marxism is a science, and others say it's a dogma, a bundle of reductionist, unscientific claims. I would suggest that Marxism is not a science in the positivist sense, formulating hypotheses and testing for predictability, but more accurately a social science, one that shows us how to conceptualize systematically and systemically, moving from surface appearances to deeper, broader features, so better to understand both the specific and the general, and the relationship between the two. Marxism has an explanatory power that is superior to mainstream bourgeois social science because it deals with the imperatives of class power and political economy, the motor forces of society and history. The class basis of political economy is not a subject for which mainstream social science has much understanding or tolerance. There's a footnote there. This aversion to recognizing the realities of class power exists even among many who consider themselves to be on the left. See the discussion on the anything but class theorists in the next chapter. Resuming. In 1915, Lenin wrote that, quote, bourgeois science will not even hear of Marxism, declaring that it has been refuted and annihilated. Marx is attacked with equal zest by young scholars who are making a career by refuting socialism and by decrepit elders who are preserving the tradition of all kinds of outworn systems, unquote. Over 80 years later, the careerist scholars are still declaring Marxism to have been proven wrong once and for all. As the anti-communist liberal writer Irving Howe put it, quote, the simplistic formulae of textbooks, including the Marxist ones, no longer hold. That is why some of us don't regard ourselves as Marxists, unquote, quoting Newsday, April 21st, 86. Here, I want to argue that Marxism is not outmoded or simplistic, only the image of it entertained by anti-Marxists like Howe. Some Durable Basics with the overthrow of communist governments in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, announcements about the moribund nature of, quote, Marxist dogma poured forth with renewed vigor. But Marx's major work was Capital, a study not of existing socialism, which actually didn't exist in his day, but of capitalism, a subject that remains terribly relevant to our lives. It would make more sense to declare Marxism obsolete if and when capitalism is abolished rather than socialism. I wish to argue not merely that Marx is still relevant, but that he is more relevant today than he was in the 19th century, that the forces of capitalist motion and development are operating with greater scope than when he first studied them. Comment there. I mean, we just went through a couple of chapters about we didn't know what we had and, you know, basically former socialist countries letting down their guard, letting capitalism in, and what happened? I mean, it's literally exactly everything that was ever said about capitalism and how it, you know, hurts worker rights and et cetera, et cetera. So as far as people saying that this is obsolete, I think this is more a question of values. You know, do they care about uh, any of those things, you know, advancing society beyond the interests of predatory capitalists, et cetera, operating industry for profit and all of the disruptions and hardships to people's lives that this brings? Actually, the fact that letting down one's guard as a socialist country, incredibly foolish move, actually just proved everything right about capitalism. Hence, yes, Marxism, of course, is correct. Capitalism has not basically changed. Technology has advanced, but the class interests, which are fundamental to capitalism, and that class struggle at the heart of it, that hasn't changed at all. So, continuing. This is not to say that everything Marx and Engels anticipated has come true. Their work was not a perfect prophecy, but an imperfect, incomplete science, like all sciences, directed toward understanding a capitalism that leaves its bloody footprints upon the world as never before. Some of Marxism's basic postulates are as follows. In order to live, human beings must produce. People cannot live by bread alone, but neither can they live without bread. 
This does not mean all human activity can be reduced to material motives, but that all activity is linked to a material base. A work of art may have no direct economic motive attached to it, yet its creation would be impossible if there did not exist the material conditions that allowed the artist to create and show the work to interested audiences who have the time for art. What people need for survival is found in nature, but rarely in a form suitable for immediate consumption. Labor, therefore, becomes a primary condition of human existence. But labor is more than a way of providing for survival. It is one of the means whereby people develop their material and cultural life, acquiring knowledge and new modes of social organization. The conflicting class interests that evolve around the productive forces shape the development of a social system. When we speak of early horticultural societies, or of slave or feudal or mercantile or industrial capitalist societies, we are recognizing how the basic economic relations leave a defining stamp on a given social order. Capitalist theorists present capital as a creative, providential force. As they would have it, capital gives shape and opportunity to labor. Capital creates production, jobs, new technologies, and a general prosperity. Marxists turn the equation around. They argue that, of itself, capital cannot produce anything. It is the thing that is produced by labor. Only human labor can create the farm and the factory, the machine and the computer. And in a class society, the wealth so produced by many is accumulated in the hands of relatively few, who soon translate their economic power into political and cultural power in order to better secure the exploitative social order that so favors them. The standard trickle-down theory says that the accumulation of wealth at the top eventually brings more prosperity to the rest of us below. A rising tide lifts all boats. I would argue that in a class society, the accumulation of wealth fosters the spread of poverty. The wealthy few live off the backs of the impoverished many. There can be no rich slaveholders living in idle comfort without a mass of penniless slaves to support their luxurious lifestyle. No lords of the manor who live in opulence without a mass of impoverished, landless serfs who till the lord's lands from dawn to dusk. So, too, under capitalism, there can be no financial moguls and industrial tycoons without millions of underpaid and overworked employees. Exploitation can be measured not only in paltry wages, but in the disparity between the wealth created by the worker and the pay she or he receives. Thus, some professional athletes receive dramatically higher salaries than most people, but compared to the enormous wealth they produce for their owners, and taking into account the rigors and relative brevity of their careers, the injuries sustained, and the lack of lifelong benefits, it can be said that they are exploited at a far higher rate than most workers. Conservative ideologues defend capitalism as the system that preserves culture, traditional values, the family, and community. Marxists would respond that capitalism has done more to undermine such things than any other system in history, given its wars, colonizations, and forced migrations, its enclosures, evictions, poverty wages, child labor, homelessness, underemployment, crime, drug infestation, and urban squalor. All over the world, community in the broader sense, the Gemeinschaft, with its organic social relationships and strong reciprocal bonds of commonality and kinship, is forcibly transformed by global capital into commercialized, atomized, mass market societies. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels referred to capitalism's implacable drive to settle, quote, over the whole surface of the globe, creating, quote, a world after its own image. No system in history has been more relentless in battering down ancient and fragile cultures, pulverizing centuries old practices in a matter of years devouring the resources of whole regions, and standardizing the varieties of human experience. Big capital has no commitment to anything but capital accumulation, no loyalty to any nation, culture, or people. It moves inexorably according to its inner imperative to accumulate at the highest possible rate without concern for human and environmental costs. The first law of the market is to make the largest possible profit from other people's labor. Private profitability, rather than human need, is the determining condition of private investment. There prevails a rational systematization of human endeavor in pursuit of a socially irrational end. Accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. More right than wrong. Those who reject Marx frequently contend that his predictions about proletarian revolution have proven wrong. 
From this, they conclude that his analysis of the nature of capitalism and imperialism must also be wrong. But we should distinguish between Marx the chiliastic thinker, who made grandly optimistic predictions about the flowering of the human condition, and Marx the economist and social scientist, who provided us with fundamental insights into capitalist society that have held painfully true to the present day. The latter Marx has been regularly misinterpreted by anti-Marxist writers. Consider the following predictions. Business cycles and the tendency towards recession. Marx noted that something more than greed is involved in the capitalist's relentless pursuit of profit. Given the pressures of competition and rising wages, capitalists must make technological innovations to increase their productivity and diminish their labor costs. This creates problems of its own. The more capital goods, such as machinery, plants, technologies, fuels, needed for production, the higher the fixed costs and the greater the pressure to increase productivity to maintain profit margins. Footnote. As an industry becomes more capital intensive, proportionately more money must be invested to generate a given number of jobs. But business is not dedicated to creating jobs. In fact, capitalists are constantly devising ways to downsize the workforce. From 1980 to 1990, the net number of jobs created by the biggest corporations in the United States, the Fortune 500, was zero. The new jobs of that period came mostly from less capital-intensive smaller firms, light industry, service industry, and the public sector. Resuming, since workers are not paid enough to buy back the goods and services they produce, Marx noted, there is always the problem of a disparity between mass production and aggregate demand. If demand slackens, owners cut back on production and investment. Even when there is ample demand, they're tempted to downsize the workforce and intensify the rate of exploitation of the remaining employees, seizing any opportunity to reduce benefits and wages. The ensuing drop in the workforce's buying power leads to a further decline in demand and to business recessions that inflict the greatest pain on those with the least assets. Marx foresaw this tendency for profits to fall and for protracted recessions and economic instability. As the economist Robert Heilbronner noted, this was an extraordinary prediction, for in Marx's day, economists did not recognize boom-and-bust business cycles as inherent to the capitalist system. But today we know that recessions are a chronic condition, and as Marx also predicted, they have become international in scope. Capital Concentration When the Communist Manifesto first appeared in 1848, bigness was the exception rather than the norm. Yet Marx predicted that large firms would force out or buy up smaller adversaries and increasingly dominate the business world as capital became more concentrated. This was not the accepted wisdom of that day and must have sounded improbable to those who gave it any attention. But it has come to pass. Indeed, the rate of mergers and takeovers has been higher in the 1980s and 1990s than at any other time in the history of capitalism. Growth of the Proletariat Another of Marx's predictions is that the proletariat, workers who have no tools of their own and must work for wages or salaries, selling their labor to someone else, would become an ever greater percentage of the workforce. In 1820, about 75% of Americans worked for themselves on farms or in small businesses and artisan crafts. By 1940, that number had dropped to 21.6%. Today, less than 10% of the labor force is self-employed. The same shift in the workforce can be observed in the Third World. From 1970 to 1980, the number of wage workers in Asia and Africa increased by almost two-thirds, from 72 million to 120 million. The tendency is toward the steady growth of the working class, both industrial and service workers. And, as Marx predicted, this is happening globally, in every land upon which capitalism descends. Proletarian Revolution as capitalism develops, so will the proletariat, Marx predicted. We have seen that to be true. But he went further. With the growing misery and polarization, the masses would eventually rise up and overthrow the bourgeoisie and put the means of production under public ownership for the benefit of all. The revolution would come in the more industrialized capitalist countries that had large, developed working classes. What struck Marx about the working class was its level of organization and consciousness. Unlike previously oppressed classes, the proletariat, heavily concentrated in urban areas, seemed capable of an unparalleled level of political development. 
it would not only rebel against its oppressors, as had slaves and serfs, but would create an egalitarian, non-exploitative social order, as never before seen in history. In his day, Marx saw an alternative system emerging in the clubs, mutual aid societies, political organizations, and newspapers of a rapidly growing British working class. For the first time, history would be made by the masses in a conscious way, a class for itself. Sporadic rebellion would be replaced by class-conscious revolution. Instead of burning down the manor, the workers would expropriate it and put it to use for the collective benefit of the common people, the ones who built it in the first place. Certainly Marx's predictions about revolution have not materialized. There has been no successful proletarian revolution in an advanced capitalist society. As the working class developed, so did the capitalist state, whose function has been to protect the capitalist class, with its mechanisms of police oppression and its informational and cultural hegemony. Of itself, class struggle does not bring inevitable proletarian victory, or even a proletarian uprising. Oppressive social conditions may cry out for revolution, but that does not mean revolution is forthcoming. This point is still not understood by some present-day leftists. In his later years, Marx himself began to entertain doubts about the inevitability of a victorious workers' revolution. So far, the prevailing force has not been revolution, but counter-revolution, the devilish destruction wreaked by capitalist states upon popular struggles, at a cost of millions of lives. Marx also underestimated the extent to which the advanced capitalist state could use its wealth and power to create a variety of institutions that retard and distract popular consciousness, or blunt discontent through reform programs. Contrary to his expectations, successful revolutions occurred in less developed, largely peasant societies such as Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam, though the proletariats in those countries participated and sometimes, as in the case of Russia in 1917, even spearheaded the insurgency. Although Marx's predictions about revolution have not materialized as he envisioned, in recent years there have been impressive instances of working class militancy in South Korea, South Africa, Argentina, Italy, France, Germany, Great Britain, and dozens of other countries, including even the United States. Such mass struggles usually go unreported in the corporate media. In 1984-85, to 85, in Great Britain, a bitter, year-long strike resulted in some 10,500 coal miners being arrested, 6,500 injured or battered, and 11 killed. For the British miners locked in that conflict, class struggle was something more than a quaint, obsolete concept. So in other countries. In Nicaragua, a mass uprising brought down the hated Somoza dictatorship. In Brazil, in 1980-83, to 83, as Peter Worsley observes, quote, the Brazilian working class has played precisely the role assigned to it in 19th century Marxist theory, paralyzing Sao Paulo in a succession of enormous mass strikes that began over bread and butter issues, but which in the end forced the military to make major political concessions, notably the restoration of a measure of authentic party political life, unquote. Revolutions are relatively rare occurrences, but popular struggle is a widespread and constant phenomenon. More wealth, more poverty. Marx believed that as wealth becomes more concentrated, poverty will become more widespread, and the plight of working people ever more desperate. According to his critics, this prediction has proven wrong. They point out that he wrote during a time of raw industrialism, an era of robber barons and the 14-hour workday. Through persistent struggle, the working class improved its life conditions from the mid-19th to the mid-20th centuries. Today, mainstream spokespersons portray the United States as a prosperous middle-class society. Yet one might wonder, during the Reagan-Bush-Clinton era, from 1981 to 1996, the share of the national income that went to those who work for a living shrank by over 12%. The share that went to those who live off investments increased almost 35%. Less than 1% of the population owns almost 50% of the nation's wealth. The richest families are hundreds of times wealthier than the average household in the lower 90% of the population. The gap between America's rich and poor is greater than it has been in more than half a century and is getting ever greater. Thus, between 1977 and 1989, the top 1% saw their earnings grow by over 100%, while the three lowest quintiles averaged a 3 to 10% drop in real income. Footnote, that's from Paul Krugman's Peddling Prosperity, Norton, 1994. The New York Times, June 20, 96, 
reported that income disparity in 1995, quote, was wider than it has been since the end of World War II, unquote. The average income for the top 20% jumped 44%, from 73,754 to 105,945 between 1968 and 1994, while the bottom 20% had a 7% increase, from 7,202 to 7,762 or only $560 in constant dollars. But these figures understate the problem. The Times story is based on a Census Bureau study that fails to report the income of the very rich. For years, the reportable upper limit was 300,000 yearly income. In 1994, the Bureau lifted the allowable limit to $1 million. This still leaves out the richest 1%, the hundreds of billionaires and thousands of multimillionaires who make many times more than $1 million per year. The really big money is concentrated in a portion of the population so minuscule as to be judged statistically insignificant. But despite their tiny numbers, the amount of wealth they control is enormous and bespeaks an income disparity a thousand times greater than the spread allowed by the Census Bureau figures. Thus, the difference between a multi-billionaire who might make a hundred million dollars in any one year and a janitor who makes eight thousand dollars is not fourteen to one, the usually reported spread between highest and lowest, but over 14,000 to one. Yet the highest incomes remain unreported and uncounted. In a word, most studies of this sort give us no idea of how rich the very rich really are. Footnote there, when asked why this procedure was used, a Census Bureau official told my research assistant that the Bureau's computers could not handle higher amounts. (laughs) What? This excuse seems most improbable, since once the Census Bureau decided to raise the upper limit, it did so without any difficulty. Another reason he gave was confidentiality. Given place coordinates, someone with a very high income could be identified. In addition, high-income respondents understate their income. The interest and dividend earnings they report is only about 50 to 60 percent of actual investment returns. And since their actual numbers are so few, they are likely not to show up in a random sample of the entire nation. By designating the top 20% as the, quote, richest, the Census Bureau is lumping in upper-middle professionals and other people who make as little as $70,000 or so, people who are anything but the, quote, richest. Back to the text. The number living below the poverty level in the United States climbed from 24 million in 1977 to over 35 million by 1995. People were falling more deeply into poverty than in earlier times and finding it increasingly difficult to emerge from it. In addition, various diseases related to hunger and poverty have been on the rise. Footnote there for more extensive data, see my essay, Hidden Holocaust USA, in Michael Parenti, Dirty Truths. City Light Spokes 96. Back to the text. There's been a general downgrading of the workforce. Regular employment is being replaced by contracted labor or temporary help, resulting in lower wages with fewer or no benefits. Comment. Boy, I'm sure glad this has gotten better in the 25 years since Parenti wrote this book, aren't you? Many unions have been destroyed or seriously weakened. Protective government regulations are being rolled back or left unenforced, and there has been an increase in speed-ups, injuries, and other workplace abuses. By the 1990s, the growing impoverishment of the middle and working classes, including small independent producers, was becoming evident in various countries. In 20 years, more than half the farmers in industrialized countries, some 22 million, were ruined. Meanwhile, as noted in the previous two chapters, free market reforms have brought a dramatic increase in poverty, hunger, crime, and ill health, along with the growth of large fortunes for the very few in the former communist countries. The third world has endured deepening impoverishment over the last half century. As foreign investment has increased, so has the misery of the common people who are driven from the land. Those who manage to find employment in the cities are forced to labor for subsistence wages. We might recall how enclosure acts of the late 18th century in England fenced off common lands and drove the peasantry into the industrial hellholes of Manchester and London, transforming them into beggars or half-starved factory workers. Enclosure continues throughout the Third World, displacing tens of millions of people. In countries like Argentina, Venezuela, and Peru, per capita income was lower in 1990 than it had been 20 years earlier. In Mexico, workers earned 50% less in 1995 than in 1980. 
One-third of Latin America's population, some 130 million, live in utter destitution, while tens of millions more barely manage. In Brazil, the purchasing power of the lower income brackets declined by 50% between 1940 and 1990, and at least half the population suffered varying degrees of malnutrition. In much of Africa, misery and hunger have assumed horrendous proportions. In Zaire, 80% of the people live in absolute penury. In Asia and Africa, more than 40% of the population linger at the starvation level. Marx predicted that an expanding capitalism would bring greater wealth for the few and growing misery for the many. That seems to be what is happening, and on a global scale. A Holistic Science Repeatedly dismissed as an obsolete, quote, doctrine, Marxism retains a compelling contemporary quality, for it is less a body of fixed dicta and more a method of looking beyond immediate appearances to see the inner qualities and moving forces that shape social relations and much of history itself. As Marx noted, quote, all science would be superfluous if outward appearances and the essence of things directly coincided, unquote. Indeed, perhaps the reason so much of modern social science seems superfluous is because it settles for the tedious tracing of outward appearances. To understand capitalism, one first has to strip away the appearances presented by its ideology. Unlike most bourgeois theorists, Marx realized that what capitalism claims to be and what it actually is are two different things. What is unique about capitalism is the systematic expropriation of labor for the sole purpose of accumulation. Capital annexes living labor in order to accumulate more capital. The ultimate purpose of work is not to perform services for consumers or sustain life and society, but to make more and more money for the investor, irrespective of the human and environmental costs. An essential point of Marxist analysis is that the social structure and class order prefigure our behavior in many ways. Capitalism moves into every area of work and community, harnessing all of social life to its pursuit of profit. It converts nature, labor, science, art, music, and medicine into commodities, and commodities into capital. It transforms land into real estate, folk culture into mass culture, and citizens into debt-ridden workers and consumers. Marxists understand that a class society is not just a divided society, but one ruled by class power, with the state playing the crucial role in maintaining the existing class structure. Marxism might be considered a holistic science in that it recognizes the links between various components of the social system. Capitalism is not just an economic system, but a political and a cultural one as well, an entire social order. When we study any part of that order, be it the news or entertainment media, criminal justice, Congress, defense spending, overseas military intervention, intelligence agencies, campaign finance, science and technology, education, medical care, taxation, transportation, housing, or whatever, we will see how the particular part reflects the nature of the whole. Its unique dynamic often buttresses and is shaped by the larger social system, especially the system's overriding need to maintain the prerogatives of the corporate class. In keeping with their system-sustaining function, the major news media present reality as a scatter of events and subjects that ostensibly bear little relation to each other or to a larger set of social relations. Consider a specific phenomenon like racism. Racism is presented as essentially a set of bad attitudes held by racists. There's little analysis of what makes it so functional for a class society. Instead, race and class are treated as mutually exclusive concepts in competition with each other. But those who have an understanding of class power know that as class contradictions deepen and come to the fore, racism becomes not less but more important as a factor in class conflict. In short, both race and class are likely to be crucial arenas of struggle at the very same time. Marxists further maintain that racism involves not just personal attitude, but institutional structure and systemic power. They point out that racist organizations and sentiments are often propagated by well-financed reactionary forces seeking to divide the working populace against itself, fracturing it into antagonistic ethnic enclaves. Marxists also point out that racism is used as a means of depressing wages by keeping a segment of the labor force vulnerable to super-exploitation. To see racism in the larger context of corporate society is to move from a liberal complaint to a radical analysis. Instead of thinking that racism is an irrational output of a basically rational and benign system, 
we should see it is a rational output of a basically irrational and unjust system. And by rational, I mean purposive and functional in sustaining the system that nurtures it. Lacking a holistic approach to society, conventional social science tends to compartmentalize social experience. So we're asked to ponder whether this or that phenomenon is cultural or economic or psychological, when usually it is a blend of all these things. Thus, an automobile is unmistakably an economic artifact, but it also has a cultural and psychological component, and even an aesthetic dimension. We need a greater sense of how analytically distinct phenomena are often empirically interrelated, and may actually gather strength and definition from each other. Marxists do not accept the prevalent view of institutions as just being there, with all the natural innocence of mountains, especially the more articulated formal institutions such as the church, army, police, military, university, media, medicine, and the like. Institutions are heavily shaped by class interests and class power. Far from being neutral and independent bastions, the major institutions of society are tied to the big business class. Corporate representatives exercise direct decision-making power through control of governing boards and directorships. Business elites usually control the budgets and the very property of various institutions. It control inscribed into law through corporate charters and enforced by the police powers of the state. Their power extends to the managers picked, the policies set, and the performances of employees. If conventional social science has any one dedication, it is to ignore the linkages between social action and the systematic demands of capitalism, avoiding any view of power in its class dimensions and any view of class as a power relationship. For conventional researchers, power is seen as fragmented and fluid, and class is nothing more than an occupational or income category to be correlated with voting habits, consumer styles, or whatever, and not as a relationship between those who own and those who labor for those who own. In the Marxist view, there can be no such thing as a class as such, a social entity unto itself. There can be no lords without serfs, no masters without slaves, no capitalists without workers. More than just a sociological category, class is a relationship to the means of production and to social and state power. This idea, so fundamental to an understanding of public policy, is avoided by conventional social scientists who prefer to concentrate on everything else but class power realities. There's a footnote there. See the discussion on class in the following chapter, chapter 9. It is remarkable, for instance, that some political scientists have studied the presidency and Congress for decades without uttering a word about capitalism, without so much as a sidelong glance at how the imperatives of a capitalist politico-economic order play such a crucial role in prefiguring the political agenda. Social science is cluttered with, quote, community power studies that treat communities and issues as isolated autonomous entities. Such investigations are usually limited to the immediate interplay of policy actors, with little said about how issues link up to a larger range of social interests. Quick comment there. I remember one time, this must have been 15 years ago, I was having a conversation with somebody that involved uh, them using the buzzword of like co-creating and like, oh, yeah, we in society are like co-creating stuff. And I was like, yeah, but some people have much more power than other people, hence their contributions to the creative process in society are, uh, you know, much, weighted much more heavily than others. There was like 30 seconds of uncomfortable silence, and I think they just walked away, which was not the effect I was going for. But I was just pointing out like, hey, there's sort of a glaring flaw in this idea that everybody is just equal. I don't know how you could even develop that in the first place, but apparently it was... Uh, you know, not received well. Anyway, continuing. Conservative ideological preconceptions regularly influence the research strategies of most social scientists and policy analysts. In political science, for instance, one, the relationships between industrial capitalist nations and third world nations are described as a dependency and interdependency and as fostering a mutually beneficial development rather than b an imperialism that exploits the land labor and resources of weaker nations for the benefit of the favored classes in both the industrial and less developed worlds. Two, the United States and other, quote, democratic capitalist societies are said to be held together by a, common values that reflect the common interest, not by b, 
class power, and domination. 3. The fragmentation of power in the political process is supposedly indicative of a. A fluidity and democratization of interest group pluralism, rather than b. The pocketing and structuring of power in unaccountable and undemocratic ways. 4. The mass propagation of conventional political beliefs is described as a. Political socialization and, quote, education for citizenship and is treated as a desirable civic process, rather than b, an indoctrination that distorts the information flow and warps the public's critical perceptions. In each of these instances, mainstream academics offer version a not as a research finding, but as an a priori assumption that requires no critical analysis, upon which research is then predicated. At the same time, they disregard the evidence and research that supports version b, by ignoring the dominant class conditions that exercise such an influence over social behavior, conventional social science can settle on surface factualness, trying to explain immediate actions in exclusively immediate terms. Such an approach places a high priority on epiphenomenal and idiosyncratic explanations, the peculiarities of specific personalities and situations. What is habitually overlooked in such research, and in our news reports, our daily observations, and sometimes even our political struggles, is the way that seemingly remote forces may prefigure our experiences. Learning to ask why. When we think without Marx's perspective, that is, without considering class interests and class power, we seldom ask why certain things happen. Many things are reported in the news, but few are explained. Little is said about how the social order is organized and whose interests prevail. Devoid of a framework that explains why things happen, we're left to see the world as do mainstream media pundits, as a flow of events, a scatter of particular developments and personalities unrelated to a larger set of social relations, propelled by happenstance, circumstance, confused intentions, and individual ambition, never by powerful class interests, and yet producing effects that serve such interests with impressive regularity. Thus, we fail to associate social problems with the socio-economic forces that create them, and we learn to truncate our own critical thinking. Imagine if we attempted something different. For example, if we tried to explain that wealth and poverty exist together not in accidental juxtaposition, but because wealth causes poverty, an inevitable outcome of economic exploitation, both at home and abroad. How could such an analysis gain any exposure in the capitalist media? or in mainstream political life. Suppose we started with a particular story about how child labor in Indonesia is contracted by multinational corporations at near starvation wage levels. This information probably would not be carried in right-wing publications, but in 1996 it did appear, after decades of effort by some activists, in the centrist mainstream press. What if we then crossed a line and said that these exploitative employer-employee relations were backed by the full might of the Indonesian military government. Fewer media would carry this story, but it still might get mentioned on an inside page of the New York Times or Washington Post. Then suppose that we crossed another line and said that these repressive arrangements would not prevail were it not for generous military aid from the United States, and that for almost 30 years the homicidal Indonesian military has been financed, armed, advised, and trained by the U.S. national security state. Such a story would be even more unlikely to appear in the liberal press, but it is still issue-specific, and safely without an overall class analysis, so it might well make its way into left liberal opinion publications like The Nation and The Progressive. Now suppose that we pointed out that the conditions found in Indonesia, the heartless economic exploitation, brutal military repression, and lavish U.S. support, exist in scores of other countries. Suppose we then crossed that most serious line of all, and instead of just deploring this fact, we also asked why successive U.S. administrations involved themselves in such unsavory pursuits throughout the world. And what if we then tried to explain that the whole phenomenon is consistent with the U.S. dedication to making the world safe for the free market and the giant multinational corporations, and that the intended goals are a to maximize opportunities to accumulate wealth by depressing the wage levels of workers throughout the world, and preventing them from organizing on behalf of their own interests, and b, to protect the overall global system of free market capital accumulation. Then what if, from all this, we concluded that U.S. foreign policy 
is neither timid, as the conservatives say, nor foolish, as the liberals say, but is remarkably successful in rolling back just about all governments and social movements that attempt to serve popular needs rather than private corporate greed. Such an analysis, hurriedly sketched here, would take some effort to lay out, and would amount to a Marxist critique, a correct critique, of capitalist imperialism. Though Marxists are not the only ones that might arrive at it, it almost certainly would not be published anywhere except in a Marxist publication. We crossed too many lines, because we tried to explain the particular situation, child labor, in terms of a larger set of social relations, corporate class power, our presentation would be rejected out of hand as, quote, ideological. The perceptual taboos imposed by the dominant powers teach people to avoid thinking critically about such powers. In contrast, Marxism gets us into the habit of asking why, of seeing the linkage between political events and class power. A common method of devaluing Marxism is to misrepresent what it actually says and then attack the misrepresentation. Come on, this would be a straw man. This happens easily enough since most of the anti-Marxist critics and their audiences have only a passing familiarity with Marxist literature and rely instead on their own caricatured notions. Thus, the Roman Catholic pastoral letter on Marxist communism rejects the claim that, quote, structural, read, class, revolution, can entirely cure a disease that is man himself, nor can it provide, quote, the solution of all human suffering, unquote. But who makes such a claim? There is no denying that revolution does not entirely cure all human suffering. But why is that assertion used as a refutation of Marxism? Most Marxists are neither chiliastic nor utopian. They dream not of a perfect society, but of a better, more just life. They make no claim to eliminating all suffering, and recognize that even in the best of societies, there are the inevitable assaults of misfortune, mortality, and other vulnerabilities of life. Comment. I mean, just life itself. I mean, you fall down, you bump your knee, it hurts. I mean, no revolution can fix that, but we can certainly fix things like homelessness, uh, being treated like crap by the system, etc. Continuing, and certainly in any society, there are some people who, for whatever reason, are given to wrongful deeds and self-serving corruptions. The highly imperfect nature of human beings should make us all the more determined not to see power and wealth accumulating in the hands of an unaccountable few, which is the central dedication of capitalism. Capitalism and its various institutions affect the most personal dimensions of everyday life in ways not readily evident. A Marxist approach helps us to see connections to which we were previously blind, to relate effects to causes, and to replace the arbitrary and the mysterious with the regular and the necessary. A Marxist perspective helps us to see injustice as rooted in systemic causes that go beyond individual choice, and to view crucial developments not as neutral happenings, but as the intended consequences of class power and interest. Marxism also shows how even unintended consequences can be utilized by those with superior resources to service their interests. Is Marxism still relevant today? Only if you want to know why the media distort the news in a mostly mainstream direction, why more and more people at home and abroad face economic adversity while money continues to accumulate in the hands of relatively few, why there is so much private wealth and public poverty in this country and elsewhere, why U.S. forces find it necessary to intervene in so many regions of the world, why a rich and productive economy offers chronic recessions, underemployment, and neglect of social needs, and why many political office holders are unwilling or unable to serve the public interest. There's a footnote there. To further pursue these questions, the reader is invited to read several of my books, Democracy for the Few, 6th edition, St. Martin's Press, 1995, Against Empire, City Lights Books, 95, and Dirty Truths, City Lights Books, 1996. Back to the text. Some Marxist theorists have so ascended into the numbing altitudes of abstract cogitation that they seldom touch political realities here on Earth. They spend their time talking to each other in self-referential code, a scholastic ritual that Doug Dowd described as how many Marxists can dance on the head of a surplus value. Fortunately, there are others who not only tell us about Marxist theory, but demonstrate its utility by applying it to political actualities. They know how to draw connections between immediate experience and the larger structural forces that shape that experience. 
they cross the forbidden line and talk about class power. This is why, for all the misrepresentation and suppression, Marxist scholarship survives. While not having all the answers, it does have a superior explanatory power, telling us something about reality that bourgeois scholarship refuses to do. Marxism offers the kind of subversive truths that cause fear and trembling among the high and mighty, those who live atop a mountain of lies. That's the end of chapter 8. Now moving on to chapter 9. Anything but class. Avoiding the C-word. Class is a concept that is strenuously avoided by both mainstream writers and many on the left. When certain words are eliminated from public discourse, so are certain thoughts. Dissident ideas become all the more difficult to express when there are no words to express them. Class is usually dismissed as an outworn Marxist notion, with no relevance to contemporary society. It is a five-letter word that is treated like a dirty four-letter one. With the C-word out of the way, it is then easy to dispose of other politically unacceptable concepts, such as class privilege, class power, class exploitation, class interest, and class struggle. These two are judged no longer relevant, if they ever were, in a society that supposedly consists of the fluid, pluralistic interplay of diverse groups. The Class Denial of Class Those who occupy the higher circles of wealth and power are keenly aware of their own interests. While they sometimes seriously differ among themselves on specific issues, they exhibit an impressive cohesion when it comes to protecting the existing class system of corporate power, property, privilege, and profit. At the same time, they are careful to discourage public awareness of the class power they wield. They avoid the C-word, especially when used in reference to themselves, as in owning class, upper class, or moneyed class. And they like it least when the politically active elements of the owning class are labeled the ruling class. The ruling class in this country has labored long to leave the impression that it does not exist, does not own the lion's share of just about everything, and does not exercise a vastly disproportionate influence over the affairs of the nation. Such precautions are themselves symptomatic of an acute awareness of class interests. Yet ruling class members are far from invisible. Their command positions in the corporate world, their control of international finance and industry, their ownership of the major media, and their influence over state power and the political process are all matters of public record, to some limited degree. Footnote for a more detailed treatment of ruling class resources and influences, See my Democracy for the Few, 6th edition, St. Martin's Press, 95. While it would seem a simple matter to apply the C word to those who occupy the highest reaches of the C world, the dominant class ideology dismisses any such application as a lapse into conspiracy theory. The C word is also taboo when applied to the millions who do the work of society for what are usually stingy wages, the working class a term that's dismissed as Marxist jargon, and it's verboten to refer to the exploiting and exploited classes, for then one is talking about the very essence of the capitalist system, the accumulation of corporate wealth at the expense of labor. The C-word is an acceptable term when prefaced with the soothing adjective middle. Every politician, publicist, and pundit will rhapsodize about the middle class, the object of their heartfelt concern, the much-admired and much-pitied middle class is supposedly inhabited by virtuously self-sufficient people, free from the presumed profligacy of those who inhabit the lower rungs of society. By including almost everyone, middle class serves as a conveniently amorphous concept that masks the exploitation and inequality of social relations. It is a class label that denies the actuality of class power. The C-word is allowable when applied to one other group, the desperate lot who live on the lowest rung of society, who get the least of everything while being regularly blamed for their own victimization, the underclass. References to the presumed deficiencies of underclass people are acceptable because they reinforce the existing social hierarchy and justify the unjust treatment accorded society's most vulnerable elements. Class reality is obscured by an ideology whose tenets might be summarized and rebutted as follows. Credo. There are no real class divisions in this society. Save for some rich and poor, almost all of us are middle class. Response. 
Wealth is enormously concentrated in the hands of relatively few in this country. While tens of millions work for poverty-level wages, when work is to be had. The gap between rich and poor has always been great and has been growing since the late 1970s. Those in the middle also have been enduring increasing economic injustice and insecurity. Credo. Our social institutions and culture are autonomous entities in a pluralistic society, largely free of the influences of wealth and class power. To think otherwise is to entertain conspiracy theories. Response. Great concentrations of wealth exercise an influence in all aspects of life, often a dominating one. Our social and cultural institutions are run by boards of directors, or trustees or regents, drawn largely from interlocking, non-elective, self-selecting corporate elites. They and their faithful hirelings occupy most of the command positions of the executive state and other policy-making bodies, and manifest a keen awareness of their class interests when shaping domestic and international policies. This includes such policies as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, designed to circumvent whatever democratic sovereignty exists within nations. There's a footnote there for a discussion of GATT, see my Against Empire, City Lights Books 95. Credo. The differences between rich and poor are a natural given, not causally linked. Individual human behavior, not class, determines human performance and life chances. Existing social arrangements are a natural reflection of largely innate human proclivities. Response. All conservative ideologies justify existing inequities as the natural order of things, inevitable outcomes of human nature. If the very rich are naturally so much more capable than the rest of us, why must they be provided with so many artificial privileges under the law, so many bailouts, subsidies, and other special considerations at our expense? Their naturally superior talents, quote-unquote, include unprincipled and illegal subterfuges such as price fixing, stock manipulation, insider trading, fraud, tax evasion, the legal enforcement of unfair competition, ecological spoilation, harmful products, and unsafe work conditions. One might expect naturally superior people not to act in such rapacious and venal ways. Differences in talent and capacity, as might exist between individuals, do not excuse the crimes and injustices that are endemic to the corporate business system. The ABC Theorists Even among persons normally identified as progressive, one finds a reluctance to deal with the reality of capitalist class power. Sometimes the dismissal of the C-word is quite categorical. At a meeting in New York in 1986, I heard the sociologist Stanley Aronowitz comment, When I hear the word class, I just yawn. For Aronowitz, class is a concept of diminishing importance used by those he repeatedly referred to as, quote, orthodox Marxists. Footnote there, Aronowitz and some other, quote, left academics do battle against Marxism by producing hyper-theorized exegesis in a field called cultural studies. That their often impenetrable writings seldom connect to the real world was demonstrated in 1996 by physicist Alan Sokal, himself a leftist, who wrote a cultural studies parody and submitted it to Aronowitz's Social Text, a journal devoted to articles that specialize in bloated verbiage, pedantic pretensions, and academic one-upmanship. Sokal's piece was laden with obscure but trendy jargon and footnoted references to the likes of Jacques Derrida and Aronowitz himself. It purported to be an epistemic exposition of, quote, recent developments in quantum gravity and, quote, the space-time manifold and, Quote, foundational conceptual categories of prior science that have, quote, become problematized and relativized with, quote, profound implications for the content of a future postmodern and liberatory science. Various social text editors read and accepted the piece as a serious contribution. After they published it, SoCal revealed that it was little more than fabricated gibberish that, quote, wasn't obliged to respect any standards of evidence or logic. In effect, he demonstrated that the journal's editors were themselves so profoundly immersed in pretentiously inflated discourse as to be unable to distinguish between a genuine intellectual effort and a silly parody. Aronowitz responded by calling SoCal ill-read and half-educated, per New York Times, May 1896. One is reminded of Robert McChesney's comment, quote, At some universities, the very term cultural studies has become an ongoing punchline to a bad joke. 
It signifies half-assed research, self-congratulation, and farcical pretension. At its worst, the proponents of this newfangled cultural studies are unable to defend their work, so they no longer try, merely claiming that their critics are hung up on outmoded notions like evidence, logic, science, and rationality. Quoting from Monthly Review, 396. In my opinion, one of the main effects of cultural studies is to draw attention away from the vital realities of class power, the outmoded things that cause Aronowitz and his associates to yawn. Comment there from me. Um, as you may know, if you've been listening to this channel for a while, I mentioned sometimes that I studied sociology in college. So I was fortunate in that the department where I was studying sociology had a mix. There were some people like very into postmodernism and uh, things like that. And then also you actually could study Marxism and, you know, class conflict and things like that. So I tended towards the latter wherever possible, but I still had to take some of the courses, um, you know, that uh, dabbled in more of the postmodern perspective. And I hated it. I mean, I didn't go in really knowing very much about it, but uh, my reaction to it was exactly this. And the, the SoCal hoax was uh, something I stumbled across in looking at why is postmodernism so bad? And I found I was really not the first person to, uh, you know, have this kind of reaction to it. I think that there are maybe some valuable insights that came in from postmodernism, but um, the problem to me is that it seemed to be exactly as Parenti is describing an attack on Marxism, modernism. I mean, that's in the name postmodernism, like that it is explicitly an attack on and intended to replace these things, not just contribute to them or expand them or whatever, but to replace them. And I think they're trying to replace them with something that is fundamentally lacking in substance and uh, just to me seems reactionary, basically, in exactly the ways that Parenti is describing here. So if you've ever felt that way, you may be a Marxist. Continuing, another left academic, Ronald Aronson, in a book entitled After Marxism, claims in the face of all recent evidence that classes in capitalist society have become, <laughs> here you go, less polarized, right? And class exploitation is not an urgent issue nowadays because labor unions, quote, oh, here we go, have achieved power to protect their members and affect social policy, unquote. Yeah, in other words, it's all balanced out now. Everything's great. Everything's going to be fine. The capitalists are going to be held in check. Yeah. Uh, fast forward to 2022. We're like holding on by our fingernails, those of us who are still holding on. This at a time when many unions are being destroyed, workers are being downgraded to the status of contract laborers, and the income gap is wider than in decades. Many who pretend to be on the left are so rabidly anti-Marxist as to seize upon any conceivable notion except class power to explain what's happening in the world. They are the anything but class ABC theorists who, while not allied with conservatives on most political issues, do their part in stunting class consciousness. Footnote here, for prime examples, try the bloated, pretentious prose of such left anti-communist theorists as Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, both of whom are treated reverently by their counterparts in this country. One recent fad of the left ABC intellectuals is postmodernism, here we go, which argues that the principles of rationality and evidence of modern times no longer apply. Long-standing ideologies have lost their relevance, as has most of political economy and theory, and one cannot hope to develop a reliable critique of class and institutional forces. While claiming to search for new meanings, postmodernism resembles the same old anti-class theories, both right and left. For a discussion and critique, see Ellen Mikesons Wood and John Bellamy Foster, editors In Defense of History, Monthly Review Press, 1977. Back to the text. The left ABC theorists say that we are giving too much attention to class. Who exactly is doing that? Surveying the mainstream academic publications, radical journals, and socialist scholars' conferences, one is hard put to find much class analysis of any kind. Far from giving too much attention to class power, most U.S. writers and commentators have yet to discover the subject. Comment. This is kind of like the uh, conservative refrain about the, quote, liberal media things like that. It's like, every, you know, it's never right-wing enough for them. It's just constant vigilance, paranoia, 
rigid guard against anything even vaguely left. Even the idea of it is incredibly threatening to them, and enough to send them into just unending tirades about it. Continuing. While pummeling a rather minuscule Marxist left, the ABC theorists would have us think they're doing courageous battle against hordes of Marxists who dominate intellectual discourse in this country. Yet another hallucination they hold in common with conservatives. Footnote. Some publications that claim to be on the left, such as Dissent, New Republic, New Politics, Telos, In These Times, and Democratic Left, can often be as unyielding as any conservative rag in their anti-communism, anti-Marxism, and of course, anti-Sovietism. In their endless search for conceptual schema that might mute Marxism's class analysis, left ABC theorists have twaddled for years over a false dichotomization between early Marx, culturalistic, humanistic, good, and later Marx, dogmatic, economistic, bad. Footnote. One of those who pretends to be on the left is John Judas, whose impressive illiteracy in regard to Marxism does not prevent him from distinguishing between humanistic Marxists and Marxists who are, quote, simple-minded economic determinists, per In These Times, September 23rd, 81. According to Judas, the latter failed to ascribe any importance to cultural conditions and political structures. I know of no Marxists who fit that description. I, for one, treat cultural and political institutions in much detail in various books of mine, but culture as anchored in an overall system of corporate ownership and control. See my Power and the Powerless, St. Martin's Press, 1978, Make Believe Media, The Politics of Entertainment, St. Martin's Press, 1992, Inventing Reality, The Politics of News Media, 2nd edition, St. Martin's Press, 93, Land of Idols, Political Mythology in America, St. Martin's Press, 94, and Dirty Truths, City Lights Press, 96. Back to the text. As Marxist scholar Bertel Ullman notes, this artificial counterpoising transforms a relatively minor development in Marx's work into a chasm between two ways of thinking that have little in common. Footnote. Ullman points out that Marx's analytic framework did not emerge from his head full-blown. In the earlier works, such as the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts and the German Ideology, Marx is in the process of becoming a Marxist and is piecing together his understanding of capitalism and history, leaning more heavily on his philosophical training and his criticisms of the Neo-Hegelians. Though more prevalent in the earlier writings, concepts such as alienation, and the language of dialectics appear throughout his work, including Capital. See Bertel Ullman's forthcoming article, The Myth of the Two Marxes. Also David McClellan, The Young Hegelians, and Karl Marx. Macmillan, 1969. Back to the text. Some ABC theorists labored hard to promote the writings of the late Italian Communist Party leader Antonio Gramsci as a source of cultural theory to counteract a Marxist class analysis. See, for instance, publications like Paul Picone's Telos during the 1970s and early 1980s. Gramsci, they said, rejected the, quote, economistic views of Marx and Lenin and did not treat class conflict as a central concept, preferring to develop a more, quote, nuanced analysis based on cultural hegemony. So Gramsci was made into, quote, the Marxist who's safe to bring home to mother, as the historian T.J. Jackson put it. And as Christopher Phelps added, quote, Gramsci has become safe, tame, denatured, a wisp of his revolutionary self. Academics seeking to justify their retreat into highly abstruse theories have created fanciful illusions about their counter-hegemonic activity. They've created a mythical Gramsci who holds views he never did, including an opposition to revolutionary socialist organization of the sort that he, following upon Lenin, held indispensable. Quoting from Monthly Review, November 95. Gramsci himself would have considered the representations made about him by ABC theorists as oddly misplaced. He never treated culture and class as mutually exclusive terms, but saw cultural hegemony as a vital instrument of the ruling class. Furthermore, he occupied a prominent position of responsibility in the Italian Communist Party, and considered himself firmly within the Marxist-Leninist camp. To the extent that class is accorded any attention in academic social science, pop sociology, and media commentary. It is as a kind of demographic trait or occupational status. So sociologists refer to upper middle, lower middle, and the like. 
reduced to a demographic trait, one's class affiliation certainly can seem to have relatively low political salience. Society itself becomes little more than a pluralistic configuration of status groups. Class is not a taboo subject if divorced from capitalism's exploitative accumulation process. So a quick comment there, uh, just to expand on that a little bit. Sometimes people will refer to class in exactly that way, like, uh, you know, uh, lower, lower, upper, lower, lower, middle, upper, middle, lower, upper, upper, upper. But this is just basically taking the range of income and then, you know, dividing it up in a somewhat arbitrary way and then looking for commonalities in the culture of, you know, people who occupy these like different income brackets. But class is fundamentally not about income bracket, although it certainly does correspond in some ways to it, but not in this way. Class is fundamentally about one's relationship to capital. And of course, there are going to be some trends that develop in terms of the wealth of capitalists versus non-capitalists. But just sort of reducing it to income bracket rather than relationship to the means of production and capital um, really neutralizes the revolutionary concept of what if we did away with the owning class, which is fundamental to Marxism in terms of the proletarian revolution, that whole concept. Continuing. Both mainstream social scientists and, quote, left ABC theorists fail to consider the dynamic interrelationship that gives classes their significance. In contrast, Marxists treat class as the key concept in an entire social order known as capitalism, or feudalism, or slavery, centering around the ownership of the means of production, factories, mines, oil wells, agribusinesses, media conglomerates, and the like, and the need, if one lacks ownership, to sell one's labor on terms that are highly favorable to the employer. Class gets its significance from the process of surplus extraction. The relationship between worker and owner is essentially an exploitative one, involving the constant transfer of wealth from those who labor but do not own to those who own but do not labor. This is how some people get richer and richer without working, or with doing only a fraction of the work that enriches them, while others toil hard for an entire lifetime, only to end up with little or nothing. Both orthodox social scientists and left ABC theorists, left always being in quotes here, treat the diverse social factions within the non-capitalist class as classes unto themselves. So they speak of a blue-collar class, a professional class, and the like. In doing so, they claim to be moving beyond a, quote, reductionist, Marxist dualistic model of classes. But what is more reductionist than to ignore the underlying dynamics of economic power and the conflict between capital and labor? What is more misleading than to treat occupational groups as autonomous classes, giving attention to every social group in capitalist society except the capitalist class itself, to every social conflict except class conflict? Both conventional and left ABC theorists have difficulty understanding that the creation of a managerial or technocratic social formation constitutes no basic change in the property relations of capitalism, no creation of new classes. Professionals and managers are not an autonomous class as such. Rather, they are mental workers who live much better than most other employees, but who still serve the accumulation process on behalf of corporate owners. Comment there. So, this is an important point. Uh, we don't want to, on the one hand, reduce class to just sort of income brackets without understanding the relationship to the means of production and the role in capital accumulation, owning versus working, things like that. That's fundamental. That needs to stay in the picture. That said, we can recognize that, but also look beyond just merely worker and capitalist. I've made frequent reference to a couple of works by Mao, one is his 1926 analysis of the classes in Chinese society. Another one is 1933, how to differentiate the classes in the rural areas. So in analysis of the classes, for example, from 1926, Mao breaks it down as one, the landlord class and the comprador class, two, the middle bourgeoisie, three, the petty bourgeoisie, four, the semi-proletariat, and then within the semi-proletariat, there are five categories. One, the overwhelming majority of the semi-owner peasants. 
two, the poor peasants, three, small handicraftsmen, four, shop assistants, five, the peddlers. Then there's also as a major category, the proletariat. And then in the 1933 piece, how to differentiate the classes in the rural areas, he breaks it down into landlord, rich peasant, middle peasant, poor peasant, and worker. So these are important sometimes when organizing is being carried out because you can't lump all peasants together because the rich peasants have more in common with the landlords and the poor peasants basically have nothing at all. So completely different situation. So also in the case of a semi-proletarian, there you have somebody who produces for themselves part of the time and then part of the time they have to sell their labor to an employer. So this is a kind of more detailed look that still keeps relationship to capital at an international, national, and local scale in the foreground, while also giving us a richer, more detailed, and nuanced look, which again can be important for doing political organizing and rallying as far as the struggle, because people are going to go in different directions based on those particular finer features of their class position. So back to the text. Everyday class struggle. To support their view that class in the Marxist sense is passé, the ABC theorists repeatedly assert that there is not going to be a workers' revolution in the United States in the foreseeable future. I heard this sentiment expressed at three different panels during a Gramsci conference at Amherst, Massachusetts, Richard Wolf country, in April 1987. Even if we agree with this prophecy, we might still wonder how it becomes grounds for rejecting class analysis and for concluding that there is no such thing as exploitation of labor by capital and no opposition from people who work for a living. The feminist revolution that was going to transform our entire patriarchal society has thus far not materialized, yet no progressive person takes this to mean that sexism is a chimera or that gender-related struggles are of no great moment. That workers in the United States are not throwing up barricades does not mean that class struggle is a myth. In present-day society, such struggle permeates almost all workplace activities. Employers are restlessly grinding away at workers, and workers are constantly fighting back against employers. Capital's class war is waged with court injunctions, anti-labor laws, police repression, union busting, contract violations, sweatshops, dishonest clocking of time, safety violations, harassment and firing of resistant workers, cutbacks in wages and benefits, raids of pension funds, layoffs, and plant closings. Labor fights back with union organizing, strikes, slowdowns, boycotts, public demonstrations, job actions, coordinated absenteeism, and workplace sabotage. Class has a dynamic that goes beyond its immediate visibility. Whether we are aware of it or not, class realities permeate our society, determining much about our capacity to pursue our own interests. Class power is a factor in setting the political agenda, selecting leaders, reporting the news, funding science and education, distributing health care, mistreating the environment, depressing wages, resisting racial and gender equality, marketing entertainment and the arts, propagating religious messages, suppressing dissidents, and defining social reality itself. ABC theorists see the working class as not only incapable of revolution, but is on the way out, declining in significance as a social formation. Footnote there, most ABC theorists have very limited day-to-day -day experience with actual working people, a fact that may contribute to their impression that the working class is of marginal import. Continuing, anyone who still thinks that class is of primary importance is labeled a die-hard Marxist, guilty of economism and reductionism, and unable to keep up with the post-Marxist, post-structuralist, post-industrialist, post-capitalist, post-modernist, and post-deconstructionist times. It is ironic that some left intellectuals should deem class struggle to be largely irrelevant at the very time that class power is becoming increasingly transparent, at the very time that corporate concentration and profit accumulation is more rapacious than ever, and the tax system has become more regressive and oppressive. The upward transfer of income and wealth has accelerated. Public sector assets are being privatized. Corporate money exercises an increasing control over the political process. People at home and abroad 
are working harder for less, and throughout the world, poverty is growing at a faster rate than the overall population. There are neoconservatives and mainstream centrists who manifest a better awareness of class struggle than the, quote, left ABC theorists. Thus, former managing editor of the New York Times, A.M. Rosenthal, sees the Republican Party's slash-and-burn offensive against social programs as, quote, not only a prescription for class struggle, but the beginning of its reality, quoting New York Times, March 21st, 95. Rosenthal goes on to quote Wall Street financier Felix Rohatten, who notes that, quote, the big beneficiaries of our economic expansion have been the owners of financial assets in what amounts to, quote, a huge transfer of wealth from lower-skilled middle-class American workers to the owners of capital assets and to the new technological aristocracy. Increasingly, quote, working people see themselves as simply temporary assets to be hired or fired to protect the bottom line and create, quote, shareholder value. It says little for left ABC intellectuals when they can be outclassed by establishment people like Rosenthal and Rohatten. Seizing upon anything but class, U.S. leftists today have developed an array of identity groups centering around ethnic, gender, cultural, and lifestyle issues. These groups treat their respective grievances as something apart from class struggle and have almost nothing to say about the increasingly harsh politico-economic class injustices perpetrated against us all. Identity groups tend to emphasize their distinctiveness and their separateness from each other, thus fractionalizing the protest movement. To be sure, they have important contributions to make around issues that are particularly salient to them, issues often overlooked by others. But they should also not downplay their common interests, nor overlook the common class enemy that they face. The forces that impose class injustice and economic exploitation are the same ones that propagate racism, sexism, militarism, ecological devastation, homophobia, xenophobia, and the like. People may not develop a class consciousness, but they still are affected by the power, privileges, and handicaps related to the distribution of wealth and want. These realities are not canceled out by race, gender, or culture. The latter factors operate within an overall class society. The exigencies of class power and exploitation shape the social reality we all live in. Racism and sexism help to create super-exploited categories of workers, minorities, and women, and reinforce the notions of inequality that are so functional for a capitalist system. To embrace a class analysis is not to deny the significance of identity issues, but to see how these are linked both to each other and to the overall structure of politico-economic power. An awareness of class relations deepens our understanding of culture, race, gender, and other such things. Wealth and Power In order that a select few might live in great opulence, millions of people work hard for an entire lifetime, never free from financial insecurity and at great cost to the quality of their lives. The complaint is not that the very rich have so much more than everyone else, but that their superabundance and endless accumulation comes at the expense of everyone and everything else, including our communities and our environment. Great concentrations of wealth give the owning class control not only over the livelihoods of millions, but over civic life itself. Money is the necessary ingredient that gives the rich their immense political influence their monopoly ownership of mass media, their access to skilled lobbyists and high public office. To those who possess it, great wealth also brings social prestige and cultural dominance, including membership on the governing boards of foundations, universities, museums, research institutions, and professional schools. Likewise, the absence of money is what makes the have-nots and have-littles relatively powerless, depriving them of access to national media and severely limiting their influence over political decision-makers. As the gap between the corporate rich and the rest of us grows, the opportunities for popular rule diminish. There is much discourse on how to balance freedom with security. History offers numerous examples of leaders who, in the name of national security, have been ready to extinguish what precious few liberties people might have won after generations of struggle. Challenges to the privileged social order are treated as a tax upon all social order, a plunge into chaos and anarchy. Repressive measures are declared necessary to safeguard people from the dangers of terrorists, subversives, reds, and other supposed enemies, both foreign and domestic. 
comment here. This was written in 97 or published in 97 at least. Uh, I'm sure after 2001, 9-11, the war on terror. I mean, this was all anybody talked about for a few years anyway. Again and again, we are asked to choose between freedom and security, when in truth, there is no security without freedom. In both dictatorships and democracies, the agencies of, quote, national security, acting secretively and unaccountably, have regularly violated both our freedom and our security, practicing every known form of repression, corruption, and deceit. Once in control of the state, plutocratic interests can use a regressive taxation system to make the public pay for the agencies of oppression that are essential to elite domination. Still, democratic governance can prove troublesome, inciting all sorts of popular demands and imposing restraints on big businesses' enjoyment of a freewheeling market. For this reason, the captains of capitalism and their conservative publicists support both a strong state armed with every intrusive power and a weak government unable to stop corporate abuse or serve the needs of the ordinary population. Aside from the systemic imperatives that cause capitalism to accumulate without end, we must also reckon with the driving force of class greed. Wealth is an addiction. There's no end to the amount of money one might desire to accumulate. The best security to being rich is to get still richer, piling possession upon possession, giving oneself over to the ori sacra fames, the cursed greed for gold the desire for more money than can be consumed in a thousand lifetimes of limitless indulgence, wanting in nothing, but still more and more money. Wealth buys every comfort and privilege in life, the fame of fortune, elevating the possessor to the highest social stratosphere, an expression of the aggrandizing self, an expansion of the ego's boundary, an extension of one's existence beyond the grave, leaving one feeling almost invulnerable to time and mortality. Wealth is pursued without moral restraint. The very rich try to crush anyone who resists their endless, heartless, unprincipled accumulation. Like any addiction, money is pursued in that obsessive, immoral, single-minded way, revealing a total disregard for what is right or wrong, just or unjust, an indifference to other considerations and other people's interests, and even one's own interests, should they go beyond feeding the addiction. Footnote, thus it is necessary and desirable to have laws to protect the environment, workers' lives, and consumer health, because big business has a total indifference to such things, and, to the extent that they cut into profits, an outright hostility toward regulations on behalf of the public interest. We sometimes forget how profoundly immoral is corporate power. Continuing, capitalism is a rational system, the well-calculated systematic maximization of power and profits a process of accumulation anchored in material obsession that has the ultimately irrational consequence of devouring the system itself and everything else with it. Comment there, while we're talking about the thought process of the rich, um, can we just add how much they hate and fear the poor and becoming poor themselves? There was a line in here about accumulating more and more because the best security to being rich is to get still richer. So this is also something that businesses have to do. Um, the profit motive is also a profit mandate because you're out there competing against other people. I mean, businesses are within whatever industry, you know, line of business that the uh, enterprise is in. If they are not constantly putting as much in their coffers as they possibly can, somebody else is going to come in and put them out of business. That's the nature of the game. If you're not on top, then you are potentially headed for the bottom. And so there's really no limit to the pursuit of staying on top. There's an old expression from the 80s, he who dies with the most toys wins. You can find t-shirts and things that have that slogan. To them, it's never enough. And again, I can't emphasize enough how much they hate poor people and fear becoming poor themselves. It's a cruel, basically psychopathic mindset. But it's very real. It's not just like some principled, cold, calculated thing. There is a fundamentally sort of disturbed psychological principle behind all of this. You know, whether people engaged in this kind of ruling class behavior start out that way or not, it's something that participation in that system forces people to confront. Am I going to go along with the demands of this psychotic, rapacious system? Is that something that I can turn a blind eye to, or 
embrace with open eyes, you know, even worse in a way, you know, know it's wrong and do it anyway. Uh, there are certainly people who decline that and become class traitors. Unfortunately, there are few in number, too many who have the opportunity to be in the ruling class, are too weak-willed to resist the temptation, and so the burden of undoing the system falls on those who do not benefit from it, the working class. We must revolt. Continuing, Eco-Apocalypse, a class act. In 1876, Marx's collaborator, Friedrich Engels, offered a prophetic caveat, quote, let us not flatter ourselves overmuch on account of our human conquest over nature, for each such conquest takes its revenge on us. At every step, we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature, like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we, with flesh, blood, and brain, belong to nature, and exist in its midst, unquote. With its never-ending emphasis on exploitation and expansion, and its indifference to environmental costs, capitalism appears determined to stand outside nature. The essence of capitalism, its raison d'etre, is to convert nature into commodities and commodities into capital, transforming the living earth into inanimate wealth. This capital accumulation process wreaks havoc upon the global ecological system. It treats the planet's life-sustaining resources arable land, groundwater, wetlands, forests, fisheries, ocean beds, rivers, air quality, as dispensable ingredients of limitless supply to be consumed or toxified at will. Consequently, the support systems of the entire ecosphere, the planet's thin skin of fresh air, water, and topsoil, are at risk, threatened by such things as global warming, massive erosion, and ozone depletion. Global warming is caused by tropical deforestation, motor vehicle exhaust, and other fossil fuel emissions that create a greenhouse effect, trapping heat close to the Earth's surface. This massed heat is altering the atmospheric chemistry and climatic patterns across the planet, causing record droughts, floods, tidal waves, snowstorms, hurricanes, heat waves, and great losses in soil moisture. We now know that the planet does not have a limitless ability to absorb heat caused by energy consumption. Comment. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are also glad that this, you know, went away in the last 25 years, right? No. Another potential catastrophe is the shrinkage of the ozone layer that shields us from the sun's deadliest rays. Over 2.5 billion pounds of ozone-depleting chemicals are emitted into the Earth's atmosphere every year, resulting in excessive ultraviolet radiation that is causing an alarming rise in skin cancer and other diseases. Increased radiation is damaging trees, crops, and coral reefs, and destroying the ocean's phytoplankton, the source of about half of the planet's oxygen. If the oceans die, so do we. At the same time, the rise in pollution and population has given us acid rain, soil erosion, silting of waterways, shrinking grasslands, disappearing water supplies and wetlands, and the obliteration of thousands of species, with hundreds more on the endangered list. Footnote, putting an end to the population explosion will not of itself save the ecosphere, but not ending it will add greatly to the dangers the planet faces. The environment can sustain a quality life for just so many people. Continuing, in 1970, on what was called Environment Day, President Richard Nixon intoned, What a strange creature is man that he fouls his own nest. With that utterance, Nixon was helping to propagate the myth that the ecological crisis we face is a matter of rational individual behavior rather than being of a social magnitude. In truth, the problem is not individual choice, but the system that imposes itself on individuals and prefigures their choice. Behind the ecological crisis is the reality of class interest and power. An ever-expanding capitalism and a fragile, finite ecology are on a calamitous collision course. It is not true that the ruling politico-economic interests are in a state of denial about this. Far worse than denial, they are in a state of utter antagonism toward those who think the planet is more important than corporate profits. So they defame environmentalists as eco-terrorists, EPA Gestapo, Earth Day alarmists, tree huggers, and purveyors of green hysteria and liberal claptrap. Some environmental activists in this country have been the object of terrorist assaults conducted by unknown assailants, 
with the implicit tolerance of law enforcement authorities. Footnote. To offer one example, the FBI was quick to make arrests when environmentalists Judy Barry and Daryl Cherney were seriously injured by a car bomb in 1990. They arrested Barry and Cherney, calling them radical activists, charging that the bomb must have belonged to them. Both had long been outspoken advocates of nonviolence. The charges were eventually dropped for lack of evidence. The bomb had been planted under the driver's seat. The FBI named no other suspects and did no real investigation of the attack. Um, additional comment and information there. Barry was involved with the IWW Radical Labor Union, also known as the Wobblies, and people studying this case from a critical perspective have proposed that it was the combination of radical environmentalism with the labor movement that was what was so threatening and may have caused what looked like an assassination attempt. Continuing, autocrats in countries like Nigeria, in bed with the polluting oil companies, have waged brutal war upon environmentalists, going so far as to hang popular leader Ken Sarawiwa. In recent years, conservatives within and without Congress fueled by corporate lobbyists, have supported measures that would, one, prevent the Environmental Protection Agency from keeping toxic fill out of lakes and harbors, two, eliminate most of the wetland acreage that was to be set aside for a reserve, three, completely deregulate the production of chlorofluorocarbons that deplete the ozone layer, four, virtually eliminate clean water and clean air standards, five, open the unspoiled Arctic wildlife refuge in Alaska to oil and gas drilling, six, defund efforts to keep raw sewage out of rivers and away from beaches, seven, privatize and open national parks to commercial development, eight, give the few remaining ancient forests over to unrestrained logging, and nine, repeal the Endangered Species Act. In sum, their openly professed intent has been to eviscerate all our environmental protections however inadequate these are. Comment. Seems to be a running theme here, but, you know, as I keep inserting, gee, I'm sure glad that this all became better over the last 25 years. No, it hasn't. I mean, that's the thing, why we need to study history, particularly of the neoliberal era. You know, it's not that hard. Go back 40, 50 years only. If you can at least get that down, you can see the picture of the particular era of capitalism that we're in currently, although, of course, going back further, very helpful as well. But uh, at a bare minimum, understanding, you know, this has been going on for decades. All of those things we've seen in the news in recent years. These struggles continue as the capitalist class tries to get their hands on more and more researches. There is just literally no limit. Nothing is sacred. Continuing. Conservatives maintain that there is no environmental crisis. Technological advances will continue to make life better for more and more people. Footnote. A cover story in Forbes, August 1495, derides the, quote, health scare industry and reassures readers that highly chemicalized and fat-ridden junk foods are perfectly safe for one's health. The magazine's owners and corporate advertisers are aware that if people begin to question the product offered by the corporate system, they may end up questioning the system itself. Not without good cause does Forbes describe itself as, quote, a capitalist tool. Now, commenting there... That is one area where we see things like the Whole Foods supermarket chain and sort of the organic movement in general. Um, you know, that has come up since the publication of this book in the last 20 years as more of a mainstream thing. Uh, as more and more people try to become health conscious, as more and more people fall into conditions of overweight and obesity, and we've talked about this in the live streams a number of times about food under capitalism, people are concerned and, you know, the industries to some extent do try to uh, respond to that, to appear relevant and to offer solutions, which don't really get to the source of the problem, but are trying to pay lip service to it, again, to buy themselves more time and more profits. That's not to say, for example, that, uh, well, to take organic products for one example, there was a movement to uh, try to clean up the food chain, get some of the pesticides out of it, etc. And then, um, unfortunately, it got picked up by corporations who had the USDA, in the case of the United States, make a definition of organic, which was far short 
of what anybody wanted. It was more corporate friendly, allowed a lot more pesticides to still be used, etc., etc. That's not to say that there isn't some value to it, but also it got heavily corrupted by corporate influences trying to preserve their profitability and their particular way of doing things cheaply and while externalizing costs onto the environment and onto consumers. Anyway, back to the text. One might wonder why rich and powerful interests take this seemingly suicidal anti-environmental route. They can destroy welfare, public housing, public education, public transportation, social security, Medicare and Medicaid with impunity, for they and their children will not thereby be deprived having more than sufficient means to procure private services for themselves. But the environment is a different story. Wealthy conservatives and their corporate lobbyists inhabit the same polluted planet as everyone else, eat the same chemicalized food, and breathe the same toxified air. Comment, in other words, no jobs or profits on a dead planet. In fact, they do not live exactly as everyone else. They experience a different class reality, residing in places where the air is somewhat better than in low- and middle-income areas. They have access to food that is organically raised and specially prepared. The nation's toxic dumps and freeways usually are not situated in or near their swanky neighborhoods. The pesticide sprays are not poured over their trees and gardens. Clear-cutting does not desolate their ranches, estates, and vacation spots. Even when they or their children succumb to a dread disease like cancer, they do not link the tragedy to environmental factors, though scientists now believe that most cancers stem from human-made causes. Comment, not just cancer, but other diseases as well. Uh, for example, anybody knows the actor Michael J. Fox, who came down with Parkinson's disease a number of years ago. Um, I was listening to an interview with him where he was talking about there were a number of other actors that he worked on with uh, some early project, like early 80s, something like that, and um, there was some kind of, uh, I don't know if it was a pesticide or, or what it was, but being sprayed on some crops. And it was like a huge cluster of cases came out of people who were on that work site. Because apparently, you know, I think it was like a pest, I think it was an insecticide. And it's a neurotoxin. That's how it kills the bugs. But it may also have attacked the human nervous system as well. Anyway, side note, continuing. They deny that there is a larger problem because they themselves create that problem and owe much of their wealth to it. But how can they deny the threat of an ecological apocalypse brought on by ozone depletion, global warming, disappearing topsoil, and dying oceans? Do the dominant elites want to see life on Earth, including their own, destroyed? In the long run, they indeed will be victims of their own policies, along with everyone else. However, like us all, they live not in the long run, but in the here and now. For the ruling interests, what is at stake is something of more immediate and greater concern than global ecology. It is global capital accumulation. The fate of the biosphere is an abstraction compared to the fate of one's own investments. Furthermore, pollution pays while ecology costs. It's an obstacle to profit, right? Every dollar a company must spend on environmental protections is one less dollar in earnings. It is more profitable to treat the environment like a septic tank, pouring thousands of new harmful chemicals into the atmosphere each year, dumping raw industrial effluent into the river or bay, turning waterways into open sewers. The long-term benefit of preserving a river that runs alongside a community, where the corporate polluters don't live anyway, doesn't weigh as heavily as the immediate gain that comes from the ecologically costly modes of production. Solar, wind, and tidal energy systems could help avert ecological disaster, but they would bring disaster to the rich oil cartels. Six of the world's ten top industrial corporations are involved primarily in the production of oil, gasoline, and motor vehicles. Fossil fuel pollution means billions in profits. Ecologically sustainable forms of production threaten those profits. Immense and immediate gain for oneself is a far more compelling consideration than a diffuse loss shared by the general public. The cost of turning a forest into a wasteland weighs little against the profits that come from harvesting the timber. This conflict between immediate private gain on the one hand and remote public benefit on the other operates even at the individual consumer level. Thus, it is in one's long-term interest not to operate a motor vehicle, which contributes more to environmental devastation than any other single consumer item. 
but we do have an immediate need for transportation in order to get us to work or do whatever else needs doing. So most of us have no choice except to own and use automobiles, comment particularly in the US, which was pretty much entirely designed by oil companies and car companies around the use of automobiles and gasoline to run them. The car culture demonstrates how the ecological crisis is not primarily an individual matter of man soiling his own nest. In most instances, the quote, choice of using a car is no choice at all. Ecologically efficient and less costly electric car mass transportation has been deliberately destroyed since the 1930s in campaigns waged across the country by the automotive, oil, and tire industries. Corporations involved in transportation put, quote, America on wheels in order to maximize consumption costs for the public and profits for themselves and to hell with the environment or anything else. The enormous interests of giant multinational corporations outweigh doomsayer predictions about an ecological crisis. Sober business heads refuse to get caught up in the, quote, hysteria about the environment, preferring to quietly augment their fortunes. Besides, there can always be found a few experts who will go against all the evidence and say that the jury is still out, that there is no conclusive proof to support the alarmists. Conclusive proof in this case would come only when we reach the point of no return. Ecology is profoundly subversive of capitalism. It needs planned, environmentally sustainable production, rather than the rapacious, unregulated kind. It requires economical consumption, rather than an artificially stimulated, ever-expanding consumerism. It calls for natural, low-cost energy systems, rather than profitable, high-cost, polluting ones. Ecology's implications for capitalism are too horrendous for the capitalist to contemplate. Those in the higher circles, who once hired black shirts to destroy democracy out of fear that their class interests were threatened, have no trouble doing the same against eco-terrorists, quote-unquote. Those who have waged merciless war against the Reds have no trouble making war against the Greens. Those who have brought us poverty wages, exploitation, unemployment, homelessness, urban decay, and other oppressive economic conditions are not too troubled about bringing us ecological crisis. The plutocrats are more wedded to their wealth than to the earth upon which they live, more concerned with the fate of their fortunes than with the fate of the planet. Footnote there, in June 1996, speaking at a UN conference in Istanbul, Turkey, Fidel Castro noted, those who have almost destroyed the planet and poisoned the air, the seas, the rivers, and the earth are those who are least interested in saving humanity. Continuing, the struggle over environmentalism is part of the class struggle itself, a fact that seems to have escaped many environmentalists. The impending eco-apocalypse is a class act. It has been created by and for the benefit of a few at the expense of the many. The trouble is, this time, the class act may take all of us down, once and forever. In the relationship between wealth and power, what is at stake is not only economic justice, but democracy itself and the survival of the biosphere. Unfortunately, the struggle for democracy and ecological sanity is not likely to be advanced by trendy, jargonized ABC theorists who treat class as an outmoded concept and who seem ready to consider anything but the realities of capitalist power. In this, they are little different from the dominant ideology they profess to oppose. They are the ones who need to get back on this planet. The only countervailing force that might eventually turn things in a better direction is an informed and mobilized citizenry. Whatever their shortcomings, the people are our best hope. Indeed, we are they. Whether or not the ruling circles still wear black shirts, and whether or not their opponents are reds, la luta continua. The struggle continues. Today, tomorrow, and through all history. And that's the end of chapter 9 and of the book. Uh, if you have a hard copy, there's just an index, a little bit of an about the author section, and uh, it's a list of the books also published by City Lights Books. So uh, I'll end by saying this. If the last few chapters were about the former socialist countries looking back at the destruction that reopening to capitalism wreaked on their societies, leaving them with the refrain of we didn't know what we had till it was gone, then let's learn from this 
extending it not just to preserving existing and future socialist revolutions, but to the planet itself and preventing ecological apocalypse, ecological collapse. Because even an oppressed poor working person still at least once in a while gets to enjoy a breeze on their face and the pleasure of the sun in springtime. But if the environment goes, we won't even be around anymore to lament the loss. So that concludes the reading of Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds, Rational Fascism and the Overthrow of Communism from 1997. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We will pick up the discussion there. I'll also be posting this file as one unbroken piece as soon as time allows. In the meantime, there is a playlist of all of these half a dozen or so videos that comprise the entire book. You should be able to find a link to that playlist in the pinned comment beneath each video, or you can just search for it on the channel. So if you haven't listened to the previous sections, make sure to go back and listen to those. It's a really key book that a lot of people feel is a pretty good reference point. You know, it doesn't contain so much Marxist theory. There's a little bit of that there in chapter eight, but you want to study the theory separately. And then I think that this is kind of a good introduction to some of the discussions that have been going on for decades in U.S. culture about Marxism and, you know, gives you some jumping off points for how to combat a lot of the myths and, you know, sort of recycled tropes of anti-Marxism, anti-communism that get brought up. So I think it is valuable, uh, definitely, for that. Anyway, thank you for listening to this book. Make sure to check out the other hundreds of videos on the channel. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. Again, we don't run ads here at Socialism for All, so all the financial support that we get comes through the Patreon. You can get your name on the screen and support us by heading to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. So thank you to all of the patrons for that. It's allowed me to spend a lot more time making these videos and administering the channel than I would have been able to do without your financial support. Also helpful for the channel is engagement, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. All of that helps to boost the videos in the YouTube algorithm. So if the financial support lets me spend the time on it, then the engagement helps to make sure that that time is maximized and helps more people to stumble across this content. You know, we want to make all of this quality information as accessible as possible to all of the working people who have questions about why society is the way it is, why do they experience oppression and exploitation, and so forth. So thank you to everyone in the community for engaging in any of those ways, and we'll catch you in the next video.